own tent, then you clean up your tent. Take off your shoes. Now you must have a mug with you, and you pair off in two persons, with two persons. And uh, one of you takes the water from the river, from the sea. And then you pour the water. Right, so I'll demonstrate it for you. Three times, you see. Um, in the river. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are people who may be drinking from the river, and there's no doubt. I will be called upon to repeat some of the things that I said yesterday. Because um, they were forgotten in the course of the day. We have to keep this as a permanent theme of concentration throughout the day. At least for this morning, this afternoon we have another concentration. For this morning, Place yourself in the consciousness of Buddha. Imagine how Buddha felt. Get right into his his consciousness. Uh, you see, we have to completely change our pattern of, of thinking and of feeling. And that is why meditation is such a traumatic experience, but only the very courageous have the courage to do it, to do it really thoroughly. It means leaving everything behind them, particularly all those attractive things that um, stimulate one. That includes one's thoughts, that includes one's personality, that includes one's emotions, 
that includes many things delightful and sorrowful. That one just leaves us. Now, yesterday I spoke about going into this loneliness, which is perhaps the first stage. In the alchemical process, it is called nigredo, or even crucifixio. He's really going through a kind of a, a very painful uh, stripping of the self into nothing more. Today we want to uh, advance further in that, into the next stage, you must um, go and sit quietly under a tree in a spot which is exposed to the sun, if possible. And um, at first you don't have to, uh, to close your eyes, it's almost better just to feel the exaltation of nature and feel yourself free, and feel yourself very peaceful. Experience what the Rishis feel, or the Buddha felt. Mm. So far away from everything that draws one in its grip. And then you begin to draw all the energy of the wood and the tree and the grass and the leaves and the insects and the air and the sun. <coughs> and it regenerates your being and heals your wounds. Now this um, first during the first part of the day, we have to go through purification, mm -hmm. and we found that the um, wonderful psychological effect of <laughs> the baptism of water made us feel wonderful. But we have to go through further purifications, and so we should once more repeat. Uh, the purifications that we did this morning, uh, yesterday morning, but I would like this time for you to do them alone, because the purpose of a retreat is to go off alone and have um, enough um, briefing to know what to do <coughs> so that you don't fall in your personal consciousness at no time, at no time, please. Allow yourself to fall back into your personal consciousness and not to be there in your human consciousness watching your puny self in the middle of the forest. No. The note for today is exaltation. You want to follow the path of the great ones? Of the rishis, of the dervishes? Well, the state is a state of exaltation. And it's the exaltation that comes through solitude. If solitude depresses you, then you're not following that path, are you? Part of it is, of course, the clarity of your insight that is able to look clearly into your lives and into yourselves and earmark all those things that hurt, all those things that block, all those things that cause confusion by the crystal clear clarity of a consciousness that has been freed from any kind of condition. So when you go into the, the solitude of the soul, the first thing that you realize is that you have been allowing yourself to be conditioned by things. Do you know what it means to be conditioned? Like you've been influenced by people, you've been 
adapting yourself to the to the uh, to the conformism of the, the pattern of life. And if you think that you have been rebelling against life, like hippism is a form of rebellion against um, forms that the society had adopted in the past, well, it is a new conformism. And so you have to even overcome that conformism. No conformism at all. You will seek freedom. This is the path of freedom. And you can only reach ecstasy when you are free. In fact, ecstasy does get freedom and freedom gives ecstasy. The holy ones uh, are exalted by, you know, just the smell of incense or the sight of flowers or the sight of the sun or the coolness of the forest and the chirping of the birds. And all these very simple things give a kind of a exaltation to the soul, which you can't experience when you're in the city. Then there is another exaltation that comes by, for example, forgiving a person whom you couldn't forgive. Great exaltation comes. Or looking in the eyes of a person and seeing, oh, such a beauty of soul. Seeing such earnestness of purpose, seeing such, well, your ideal of <coughs> divine, of what, you, of what you call God, when you see it working in the person, and you're exalted by that person. That you can have in the city, that you can have in the city. But when you you get so involved with relationships and situations, it takes away your result. It takes away your ability to to see into the soul of people, to enjoy the exaltation of God. And so you get away. And the further you go, the more you are able to communicate with beings, with people whom you know, you reach them in their soul. And then you'll find that when you come and uh, talk to them again, your relationship with them will be so much easier. Because you have seen them in their soul. That is why a retreat is so important. It brings you out of one pattern, which is inextricable, unraveled the knots, clarifies you, purifies you, balances you, frees you, and then you begin to feel charged with new magnets. Before you felt like you'd been, there was a leakage of your magnetic field, you were being depleted of energy. And now you're recharging it. If thoughts come, don't fight against the thoughts. They have their purpose. We're so used to the rat race, which is either making simple and struggling. Let the thoughts come. <clears throat> but you can unmask them by seeing what's behind them. And then they lose all their power upon you. So they can't fool you anymore because you see where they come from. They come from that whole pattern of life which is based upon 
der große Assumption des Datums. And that of course the assumption is that I am he. It seems to be the most evident thing in the world. And it is the greatest lie that there is. And so when you go into the solitude, you begin to realize that that word me doesn't make sense. Your body, it's part of the body, it's part of it. It's the same thing as the earth, it's the same thing as the air, it's the same thing as the water. It's made up of those substances. It is burning in a slow consumption. <coughs> and the further upward you go, the less individual you are, and the more you are the totality. And when you realize that, then all those tensions, those surface tensions at the border between the ego and the universe simply fade away. And then you experience of such communication with all of them. That gives you exaltation. Freedom from that very heavy thought of me. Freedom from yourself. Of course, the sense of the self is given back again but then completely configured as a vehicle of the divine power and that is Sufism. But for the moment we are going into this by following the path of Buddhism. So I would like you to do this now. Uh, I will repeat again in the four stages of the purification practice. <laughs> so please first do the purification practice, and then afterwards, just get yourself into the state that I've been talking about. The purification practice is a further purification after the purification of the, of the body. It is really the purification of the magnetic field, which is polluted just like the body gets dirty. So the magnetic field gets so overloaded with all kinds of dross. And it can be purified by the four elements. And of course we think of the four physical elements like earth, water, and there. But in fact, it's more like in the new modern conception of the solid, the fluid, the igneous, the volatile, the, the, the principle behind earth, which is solid, or the principle behind water, which is flowing, and the principle behind fire, which is burning, and the principle behind air, which is dissipating all the time. And so you go through these cosmic processes with the breath. The first breath is in through the nose, out through the nose. The second one is in through the nose, out through the mouth. The third one is in through the mouth, out through the nose. And the fourth one is in through the mouth and out through the nose. In other words, we're increasingly breathing in through, breathing through the mouth. And when we breathe through the mouth, the mouth is practically closed so that the air is drunk into the lips and blown out from the lips and gives them a very cool feeling. The first practice is with, uh, based on filtering, we call it the baptism of earth. Mm -hmm. And in this 
practice, we feel the gravity pull of the earth that draws the densest part of your magnetic field toward itself and resolves all impurities. That's the feeling of the earth. You touch the earth. You feel the earth. What that means is that the earth draws to itself all impurities. in its generosity. And then there is another pull that you will feel exercised on your being, which is sometimes interpreted as being buoyancy, and that you feel when you are exalted, something that is pulling you up to heaven, that is overcoming the gravity pull, that goes in the counter direction to the gravity pull of the earth. And so in this practice, you, you stress, you emphasize these two forces by thinking about them. They will begin to be more active. <clears throat> and uh, so gradually you will feel like part of your being, uh, your magnetic field is drawn down, part of it is drawn up, and that is the filtering process. So when you breathe in, you feel the process of being drawn up, and when you breathe out, of being drawn down. Now the water, the next practice. Water, what does it mean? What is conjured in your mind? A flow. And your magnetic field, what you think of it, it's like Say, for example, the magnetic field around the magnet, it's kind of stationary, it's not really stationary, but it's got a kind of a, a centration, it is centered, and then it radiates. Now, centripetal and centrifugal, uh, centrifugal forces. But the flow of the, let's say, cosmic magnetism flows through your magnetic field, just like a river flows through the lake of Geneva. And you experience that flow that carries with it all impurities. When you're able to concentrate on the water, you experience a certain aspect of of Khidr, who is the larger uh, when uh, the, the flow of water that keeps on uh, uh, like a cascade, okay, you're drenched with this magnetism that descends upon you from above. And the breath, if you remember, is downwards. That is, you breathe in through the nose, not through the mouth. That helps you to remember. The nose is above the mouth, right? So you breathe downwards. As you breathe in, you're drawing so conscious of the rain pour, pouring upon your head and like a shower and as you exhale and the water continues flowing but literally between the cells of your body not just around your body it will be permeated by this refreshing flow of water third purification by fire that is in this part of you. This has to do with the Kundalini process. If you are able to become aware of that burning, intense burning that takes place at the bottom of your spinal cord, will be, begin to awaken that process and increase it to such an extent that you really have almost continually a burning feeling at the bottom of the spine. But beware <coughs> of fire. Fire is an energy that must be always transmuted into light. 
Ya jelasin Ya What we call our consciousness is like a light that thrusts its light upon all things and that has been born out of the transmutation of matter into spirit or let's say our body into consciousness. If you're conscious of this process it will help you to enhance the luminosity of your being which includes your aura and it, and it includes just pure consciousness you will feel like a, a bright consciousness and then your aura will start radiating stronger if you feel very clear in your consciousness if you identify your consciousness with light And so you have to associate these two things in this breathing practice. You drawing you have to breathe in through the mouth. And you're breathing through the mouth, you're drawing the the flame upwards from the Braises, which are uh, from the, uh, <clears throat> the smoldering embers, which are at the, in the bottom of your spine. The flame rises and uh, begins to uh, explode, as it were, in a kind of a outburst of light, of warm light, in the heart center. And then if you're able to follow it up further up, further up as you breathe in, you find that it is, it seems to be spraying into uh, many directions. It's like a fountain at the top of your head. Oh, there is a, there is a central canal in the middle of that fountain. And in that central canal, there something seems to be descending, and that is the Vajra, the lightning. It's a kind of energy that is, I don't know whether to call it light or fire. It's, um, well, it's lightning. And it, it, uh, it, it, it's energy that is highly tensile in the tennis. It reaches right down into the spinal cord, just like lightning with tremendous force. As you 